Welcome to the Secure Connections podcast brought to you by IOTSA, the Internet of Things Security Services Association. I'm your host, Brian Sherman, Content Director for IOTSA, and I'm so looking forward to today's conversation. Our special guest on this episode is the one and only Tony Anscom, Chief Security Evangelist at ESET, who will be sharing his insight on data privacy rules and the latest legislation, as well as a few other topics. Of Welcome to the Secure Connections podcast, Tony. Hey, hi, Brian, and it's uh, great to be here. It is awesome to have you. Um, as a first-time guest, I get to indoctrinate you the right way. Um, we love to get the audience to, to know you a little bit um, and discuss your journey in the IT and security community. So uh, what drew you into the IT field, Tony? Well, firstly, to get into the IT field was, um, you remember ZX81? You know, the old Spectrum home computer when they first came out. I, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to say I do, but yes. Yeah, I, I, I remember it well because that was my fir- first computer at home. And I, I took to programming. You know, there were some, pro- there were some uh, games you could play like Football Manager. Uh, and I'm talking here, Soccer Manager, but in the UK it was Football Manager. Um, you know, I took to making my own modifications and starting to uh, add my own code to some of these games, which you could, yeah, which was fairly simple to do back then. Um, so actually, I found I had a natural aptitude to, to programming and uh, took a job with one of the banks, actually writing code for uh, PC early PCs. Very good. And I know your experience in in tech is quite diverse. Can you tell us a little about the journey, how you ended up in your current role? Um, Security evangelist sounds like an awesome title and an awesome job too. So um, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you got into that part. Uh, And it it certainly is an awesome job. Awesome job. I I love what I do, which is great. Uh, But, you know, from those early days of programming, yeah, working for for a couple of banks and and just to give you some background, you know, when programming was programming back then, you know, Programs were on one floppy disk, and the data was on another floppy disk. Yeah, so, so it was very different back then. But I, I got into the networking elements. I moved from uh, programming to the more fi- what I define as more physical. It's, of course, it's still virtual, but netware, uh, banyan vines, and pulling cable, token ring, and Ar- ArcNet and Ethernet. Um, and actually, I worked for American Express for a while back then. I worked for them for four years. And got in. I was actually moved into the business, uh, looking to see how we could uh, change their business by deploying technology in the field. Uh, and it was a super exciting time back then. You know, we were out on the edge. We channel attached controllers. We pushed fiber to desktops, and we were doing all sorts of things that people said you couldn't do. So it was really, really exciting. From there, you know, I had relationships with a number of vendors. Yeah, you know, a few years go past. One of the vendors offers me a job. I moved to Vendorland, um, and I've never looked back, actually, because I then specialized in security. And, and while working for banks, obviously, security is a huge component, and everything you do has to be thought of in that way. Uh, but then moving into security, a uh, security vendor for authentication products, uh, encryption products. Um, and then about 10 years ago, somebody said to me, I, I was actually taking some time off to, to renovate part of our house. Um, and somebody called me in turn and said, hey, we've got this consumer company, this antivirus company. You should come talk to us. And I did. And hey, you know, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been in that consu- uh, around the antivirus market. Uh, and it's been an awesome journey. Uh, you know, and how do you, how do you get to be the evangelist? I think that was, that was partly, that was part, part of it, yeah. That was part of your question in there. So I've gone from technical, I've gone through some sort of commercial element there in some of the vendors. But once you've been around for 20, 25 years, you've got this wealth of expertise and knowledge. And if you've got the ability to have a technical background, you know, I couldn't hold my own programming today or doing whatever. But, um, you know, I do have that technical background background that I can bring to a conversation uh, and explain things in an easy way. If you've got that, well, there you go. There's my evangelism. That makes sense, especially in the channel where, you know, you're, you're mixing business technology mm-hmm. Um, compliance, especially, I know I'm finding a, a quite quite a high amount of individuals that are in the security space now that came from a banking a banking background, uh, financial background. Um, some of the other ones are, are probably legal too. Do you, do you find you know having that 
business background has helped you? I know it's been a few years removed, but you still probably have connections and, and keep attuned to what's happening there. So I still keep I still keep a hand on that business background as well. So for the last vendor I worked for, I was in the legal team for two years, uh, as running compliance. So. So that gives you a really good insight actually into how the business runs, how it operates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's been really useful. I also have a second role, um, kind of a, a, a side role, but it's definitely not a side role because it's just as much of a big job as the evangelism. Um, I also look after our relationships with some of the key technology companies like Google and Microsoft, some of those big players where Actually, as a security provider, you need to have an in-depth relationship with some of those platform providers to actually produ- you know, produce products that have the right level of integration with their platforms to provide the security. Um, so I run some of those relationships as well. Fantastic. Well, well, thanks for sharing some of your background. And yeah, I think that broad experience can be uh, beneficial, even for for MSPs too, I know that are trying to recruit in sales and sales and marketing and others is, is to look at uh, those that have dabbled in whether it's different fields that they're they're um, going after for the target markets or um, just that that understanding of being able to build relationships in addition to the technical side and the sales side and the marketing side. Um, so it's uh, it's a more diverse uh, world that we live in now, especially in the IT industry. So one of the things I want to talk about, the global map of privacy legislation and industry standards requirements continues to grow. Um, that's one thing I saw, and I think at your CompTIA presentation last, last year at ChannelCon, um, this was one of the topics. How do you see that global expansion affecting MSPs today, Tony? Well, I, th- I think it's super interesting. So let's just kind of step back one, because sometimes people often turn and say, why are we at this point now? where legislation is coming in. Um, you know, I, I view you and I, Brian, we, we were kind of, we've spent the last 20 years growing up with this internet-connected life. Um, now you've got, you know, you've got young people leave, you know, in the workplace that have never been disconnected. You know, we were disconnected once upon a time, weren't we? So I think we, we were the guinea pigs, and I think a lot of what we've, you know, we've learned along the way were, you know, what pri- you know, we were not aware that privacy would be such a big issue. We were not aware how all this, how it impacts us socially. We were, all these things are new. This is kind of like, if we go back to the Industrial Revolution 200, 250 years ago, people said, ran, ran around factory floors and said, oh, my God, there's not going to be jobs for people because we're automating things. And, yeah, society's going to disappear. I, and I think we're kind of at that point. <laughs> yeah. But actually, I think now governments are stepping in and and putting in some legislation and regulation and turning around and saying, actually, if we use the technology in the right way and we protect our our citizens, you know, we you know, it's not going to be the Armageddon that some people may think it is. Um, and you know, the Industrial Revolution proved that actually human race is is quite resilient. As as we evolve, actually, we find new things to do and we we progress. Yeah, it it doesn't all stop. Um, but the, there's a huge opportunity in here for, for MSPs, yeah. But there's from two sides as well. Um, yeah, if, if you talk to an MSP about privacy legislation and regulation, are you talking to them as them, as a company, or are you talking to them as the business opportunity for their customers? True, it's both options. Yeah, so, so first, firstly, every com- every com- it, yeah, if, you're provide- if you're looking to provide services to your customers around legislation of this type, Obviously, you need to be a good example. So, I mean, any MSP that's dealing in uh, encryption authentication and to, to answer some of these legislation questions needs to be leading leading their charge by example. So, they should be deploying that technology themselves. So, they should have a deep understanding of you know where their data is, who's got their data, you know what it, what it was collected for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those are the lessons they should be taking across to their customers. So it's a huge business. It's a huge, huge business opportunity. If you look at a lot of the analyst reports, Gartner, et cetera, et cetera, they actually attribute some of the growth in the cybersecurity market to the privacy legislation, both GDPR and CCPA. That makes perfect sense. And, and I know, how do you see growing compliance concerns affecting the channel long term? I know there's some implications with some of the latest legislation and even standards that the fees and fines will start are starting to trickle down into the providers 
that are supporting businesses, but what other things do you see uh, occurring over the next few years as far as compliance? Well, one thing I think it changes the way, uh, the, I think it changes um, the budget at the other end. So it, you know, if we go back two or three years, um, you'd be talking to somebody, you'd be talking about risk. You know, it was nearly like selling life insurance, or what happens when you die one day? You know, you're, we, you know, uh, security salespeople would be in there going, well, what happens if you get a cyber attack one day? You, know, you need to be protecting against it. I think that's changing. Um, the, the conversation now is actually you need to comply with this legislation that says you need to be doing these things and doing them in a secure fashion and holding data in a secure fashion. So suddenly, from selling this risk that it was, yeah, to a certain degree, you couldn't put a value on it to people, uh, to now, whereas what you're actually doing is turning around and saying you need to comply. If you don't, by the way, this is, this is what's going to happen. Somebody's going to come and slap you with this really big fine and it's going to you know, potentially destroy your business. Um, of course, those things could have happened with that other risk as well. They could have dis- destroyed the business. In fact, I, I, you know, there was a story just around Christmas, wasn't there, where a company got shut down from a piece of ransomware, which is absolutely devastating for 300 employees, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, with legislation, it's very different. Yeah, it's actually now a requirement as opposed to a, I'll deploy as much as I think I need to deploy. Right, it makes, it, it's business sense, first of all, but obviously it has longstanding implications to uh, to not just the the company's reputation, but also to their, their, their livelihood and what they're doing. It, and that includes MSPs. Uh, reputation is, is hugely important and they're kind of the target of attacks these days. But let's... um. Let's kind of look at the compliance factor, because I know in the past, Sarbanes-Oxley, we had um, HIPAA. A lot of the compliance was more focused on specific industries, whereas GDPR kind of changed the equation a little bit. And um, one of the latest regulations, which I hope to dive into a little with you, is the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, Some are comparing this to GDPR, and the implications on MSPs are are a little different, too, than the Sarbanes-Oxley's and others. What are some of the key concerns of this legislation for MSPs, Tony, in in California as well as in other locations? Well, so so let's start. I think GDPR was the first, you know, the first big piece of global legislation that got on everybody's uh, everybody's radar. So now let's start there. I mean, what what is it that uh, a regulator is trying to achieve with a piece of legislation? Um, And it's actually in the consumer's interest. So... As you and I, as consumers, it's all this privacy legislation gives is giving us control of our data, or in, either in full or in part. Uh, and I say that because different legislation has you know has different requirements and, and works in different ways. But basically, it gives us the right for deletion. It gives us the right to know what somebody holds against us, and you know it either is asking us to opt in to the collection of that data or it's asking you know, or it's alerting us to the collection of the data depending on the legislation um, so suddenly now as consumers we get put back in control yeah uh, and that's the core component of, of the, this legislation now there are some differences so for example under gdpr um, it's opt in and uh, CCPA, which is California's privacy legislation that came into effect on the 1st of January, um, it's a notification. So you are opting in because you should read the notification and then you're, you're, you're still submitting your data. But there's a, there's a difference between actually ticking the box and just clicking OK. Yeah, we all know that yeah, a lot of us don't read what's on the screen. We just get click happy. Sure, uh, sure. Especially when we're excited about buying something or, or whatever, yeah? uh, we, we ignore some of these things. Um, and there's differences in the fines, but we, we, we can come back to that. Um, but, but you know, there's the right to also understand what a company holds about you. Uh, you know, if you look at some of these data companies, there's these huge, huge data companies now, data, data science companies, which are amassing massive amounts of data from all these different different places, and we're being profiled and. You know, one great example of that, that of course we all know, was Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, um, we saw the power of data. Yeah, and if if I'm sure lo- lots of the people listening or watching this have watched the great uh, the great hack on Netflix. Yeah, 
Oh, well, I hope they haven't have, and if they haven't, they should do. They should. Something. They definitely they should. So they get themselves nice and scared, <laughs> um, and get their tin hat and go and live in the woods somewhere. Yeah, you know, but it, it shows the power of actually you bring this data together, and while we as consumers don't necessarily think about the consequences of sharing our data, um, once somebody actually amasses that much data about us, that they can they can influence the way we think. Um, you know, and it's it's a really good question. How do you value your data? You know, what you think, you know, giving up your email address has a different value to you than it does me. Um, and I think if we put a hundred of us in a room, we'd all have a different line in the sand of what we think is reasonable and what's not. And it, you know, and it's it's taking that privacy legislation, that privacy privacy right into business, and suddenly changing a business, changing an SMB, changing you know, and the the MSP is part of changing the SMB's viewpoint on this of what's acceptable and what's not. And what what is in compliance and what's not, and that's a tough one because I don't think MS, you know, I don't think the channel is being close enough to their customer, especially with some of those really sm much smaller businesses that might be database companies. Maybe they haven't been uh, close enough to actually understand what all those requirements are. And this is one of those pieces like GDPR too that centers around the user's location rather than where like the MSP is located that's taking care of it or their client is located, right? Is if they're supporting a client in North Carolina, but that client has one customer that's in California, how, how does that, are they fully required to comply with this? Can you that's give us a, detail? That's a great point, right? Brad. This is, and and I, I will give you an amusing story about location in just, just a second, but there are sure. differences in the legislation. So GDPR, affects people that are based in the EU. So if you tra if, if you and I get on a plane this afternoon and we go and we, we land at Frankfurt or we land in London or we wherever it is we land in Europe, um, GDPR is covering us. Even though we're not citizens of Europe or any country in Europe, well, you're, you're not, I, I, I obviously am, but because um, <laughs> you can hear that from my accent. But... Um, it's, it's actually by our physical location at the time that we're transacting. Okay. Yeah. The California legislation is on Californian residents. So now as a California resident, I fly to, to Frankfurt or, or Heathrow, and when I get off the plane and get my laptop out, I'm still covered by CCPA because I'm a Californian resident, and I'm covered by GDPR, because I'm physically located in Europe. So this, so my point here is we thought, you know, you gave the example of what happens if somebody in North Carolina was doing business with somebody in, in California. Right. I actually don't think you can think, I think if you want to get that granular and you want to turn and say, for each individual, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use what I can in the right privacy legislation for the for the, for the different people coming from different places. I think as a business, certainly as a small business, I think I'd just turn and say, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adopt the highest standard of privacy legislation in all of this privacy legislation, and I'm going to adopt that for all of my customers. Because it's only a matter of time before North Carolina will have the same leg yeah, will have legislation that's similar or somewhat similar. That's true. Um, if if you follow that standard, there's really only a couple of deviations. Wouldn't there be maybe uh, recovery time objectives? Uh, I think those may vary with legislation, and maybe not. Maybe there's a realistic expectation that it just has to be appropriate. Well, there are there are differences in the legislation. So, for example, GDPR specifies that you must encrypt data. Uh, you have to have right. strong authentication. The California legislation talks about you have to have implemented reasonable security. Um, which is kind of a little bit of a subjective term, isn't it? I mean, reasonable. I mean, what does what does that what, mean? What does that mean? That's a really good question. I, I think I think we're going to find out when somebody brings the first few cases uh, later this year, because I'm sure there will be cases, and we'll find out whether those companies have reasonable security. But I think what I would do is is kind of I would put together the core core components of the different legislation, and I'd turn and say, well, there are certain things in there that I think are are mandatory so for example encryption encryption of data yeah consumer data yeah people often say well what should i encrypt well i'll give you an easy term just encrypt everything yeah yeah if, if, if you have a laptop put full disk encryption on it yeah, why wouldn't you 
Sure. Because if somebody steals my laptop, I want to know that, that some bad guy didn't get my data. Um, you know, if somebody gains access to a, a server in your company, if it's all encrypted, we're, we're already some way down the path. Um, however, that doesn't always answer the question. I, and we, we come back to a good example of why that doesn't. You know, authentication. You know, today, strong authentication is, is, in my view, mandatory for anything, anything that's sensitive that you're trying to protect. You know, whether it's you as a consumer with your bank account or whatever, but if you've got a company asset, you've got customer data, you've got an ordering system, a finance system, all of these should be protected by two-factor authentication. And two-factor authentication doesn't necessarily mean these days using SMS or, or, or tokens or whatever. You know, it can be an app on the phone. And yeah, you know, a lot of them are very now clever of it will just ping a, a message on your phone that says, "Are you logging in?" And you just say yes, and it gives you access on the on the desktop. So it doesn't need to be complex, and it doesn't need to be difficult to do this. Um, and one thing I, I think all organisations is it should have is a data protection officer. So this is actually a requirement under GDPR. If your business is over a certain size, you have to have a DPO. I actually believe that. Even in a small business, you need to have somebody that's responsible. It can't be everybody's responsible. Right. You need one person to own the fact, the privacy of the data that's actually being collected by the business. They've got to understand where it is and be in control of whether it's in compliance with the regulations. Um, Even in the MSP community, I think we're starting to see where they're hiring, hiring or at least making one person responsible for being the CISO. Um, within their their company, and then also the, uh, applying to the standards that they set for their clients too. So it's kind of two different factors: is are we protected first, and then the other one is what are the standards we're implementing within our clients? Uh, that seems to be um, pretty rampant these days. It seems like every MSP I talk to is either has one hired or is looking to hire one if they're you know ten to twenty employees even. Yeah, I may, you know, in certain instances where, where maybe it's you know, a much smaller business that might actually, have, you know, some small businesses you know, have very big footprints. Yeah, very big yeah. footprints. You know, but, even in companies like that, I, you know, an MSP should be able to provide some of those skill sets down into their customers as well. Right. Now, one of the terms that I, I've seen you using is defensible defense, which uh, seems to be you know, pretty predominant with your team. What are regulators expecting from businesses um, as far as that? What does it mean, in other words? Well, so, so, so let's take, uh, for example, for, uh, we, can, we kind of coined that term uh, for, for my presentation at the channel. And uh, the reason we coined it was, was actually the word reasonable. So how do, how do you deal with something that maybe you don't understand what the word reasonable really means? Well, what you've got to do is actually show that you had the right intent and that you took the right actions uh, of the best possible actions you could think of. So the defensible defense is, well, you know, I, I deploy, I, I had a person assigned, you know, as a DPO, as a CISO. I had, you know, we, we encrypted our customer data. We, we patched our servers. We did this, that, and the other. You can show that actually your intent was good. And that when the unthinkable happens and you get that data breach, yeah, um, when the regulator steps in f through your front door, you can actually turn and say, well, here, here, here was what we were doing. We don't believe we could have done any more or we don't understand what else we could have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And that's the defensible defense. So it's, <laughs> it's following best practices, having the plans in place, and even despite those things, some things can happen, but at least if you've done the actionable or taken the actionable steps that are reasonable, going back to the previous word, then that's really what you're focusing on or should be focusing on. Yeah, and there's, lo there's lots of, uh, in fact, we, we produced around CCPA, we produced a white paper at ESET that kind of gave you, this, is, this was our view of what you should be doing to provide security within your organization. And that primarily was, you know, it was ha have a person assigned the encryption authentication we've already talked about, backup and recovery. You know, you need to be able to have the, the ability to, to recover if you have an incident. You know, some, some, somebody gets into your network and holds you to ransom, you want to be able to start again. You know, you need to be able to testing those solutions on a, on a regular basis. You need to have your processes written down. One of the big things, if you look at most data breaches and incidents that we see, you know, most of them are human error. Uh, 
you know, somebody clicking on a link, opening an attachment, and suddenly some uh, spear phishing attack, you know, creates a credential issue. You know, the bad guy gets in, takes the data, and off he off he goes. Um, you know, computer awareness training, such a big thing. And in fact, this is such a big opportunity for the for MSPs and the channel is to actually be providing uh, computer awareness training to their customers and making sure that that's not, not a one hit. You don't do computer awareness training this year and then go back in five years and offer it again. Right. Yeah, this is a... It's an ongoing you know, process. Absolutely. You need to be running this past your customer, every, you know, if not more frequently, but at least once every 12 months, your employees should go through this. You know, not to click. Understand, yeah, being able to identify when something's real, when something's not. Um, you know, fake versus real is, is becoming challenging. You know, we've seen lots of deep fake videos and lots of other fakes appearing in the internet recently, um, which makes it harder and harder, doesn't it? And, and of course, the bad guys are becoming cleverer at this. You know, spear phishing attacks, you know, as we keep hearing about AI and the automation of technology and, and all these great things, yeah, let me tell you, the cyber criminals are going to get there too. Yeah, they're going to be able to create spear phishing attacks or, or phishing emails that are customized based on data, your data that may be in the dark web. Yeah, they'll actually be able to customize knowing your profile. Makes, makes perfect sense. Now, um, Tony, before, before I move on, you mentioned a white paper. Where can our listeners find that white paper before I, before I get to the next step here? If you come to uh, eset.com slash ccpa. Okay, that easy. Yeah, that easy. Awesome. Um, now, what type of penalties, you mentioned it earlier, we were going to talk about what type of penalties are associated with this legislation? Well, so, so let's talk about GDPR to start with because we've, we've already yep. seen some of the fines. So, so let, let's, uh, Certainly. So let, and, we, and we, can, we can shock everybody with the big numbers. Yeah. Um, so GDPR has 20 million uh, euro fines or 4% of uh, revenue. Now, that's a, those are big fines. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we've seen some big fines implemented. So British Airways was fined for $236 million um, for a breach that happened on their website. It was a code injection on their website that collected customers' data. Um, during, a, during a certain period, it, was, it affected 500,000 users. Yeah, so there, there you go. There was there was a big fine, and we saw um, Starwood. So the Marriott Group, the Starwood Rewards uh, program, was hacked. Um, oh, curious, curiously, the person that got into that network, that data breach, they also stole the the encryption tools. Yeah. So when I said earlier on that you know sometimes it doesn't solve everything. If you leave the tools laying around, and the, and the bad guy gets those too, then he may have the ability to decrypt. Uh, they got fined. I think it was about 130 million dollars, uh, and that was a, that was a breach for 500 uh, 500 million users. So you can wow. see 500,000 users to 500 million users here. There was a, a vastly different different amount. So the regulator there is actually turning around and saying, "Well, one, one company was taking this far more seriously than the other, so the fine shouldn't be as big." Or I assume that's how the regulator came to to that conclusion. Well, you can well, see how that, that works out. Right. I was going to say, one of the objections that I know the MSPs get is that, you know, they'll see these big fines and stuff, but they're like, yeah, but that's not my clients. My clients, you know, they're smaller um, SMB, you know, maybe mid-sized companies too. Are you starting to see the GDPR fines hitting there, although they may not be as publicized because they're not as, you know, sexy and, and huge? I don't think the reg- – I think um, – and this is, this is where one of the major differences are between these two pieces of legislation. GDPR is by regulator. So you're talking to a government body. You're talking to yep. somebody, and they don't want to go. Ha- they don't want to go hammering small businesses. They want to make sure that businesses are, are becoming compliant, have got the right steps in place, are doing the right things. So they, I think, regulators will work with you more. CCPA, um, to me, has a nasty sting in the tail. It puts the the, the fine back in the hand of a lawyer. Um, you know, so I think when you see a breach on a uh, of that involves California residents, you're going to see some lawyer, you know, he's going to have the swimming pool sales guy around that afternoon because he's going to, he's going to be thinking about how he's going to spend the money he makes starting a class action lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there, there are some set parameters. So the, 
the, uh, the, the state attorney general has the ability to fine the company for seven and a half thousand dollars per incident. Um, but you, it then puts the, as a victim of the breach, um, you join the class action lawsuit, you can get between a hundred dollars and seven hundred and fifty dollars uh, per incident. So now, if, if to put that in real terms, say you have a company that's doing business with one or has the data of one percent of Californians, and at the low end of the hundred dollars, that's forty million dollars. Sure, right. Adds so, up quickly. Yeah, it adds up very, very quickly. And you know, one percent is not is not that difficult to do if you're running a, a reasonable business. Just think about a grocery store. You know, if you had a grocery store chain with with ten in the Los Angeles area, for example. Um, that could be significant. I think that's what you have to look at with it is individually, they seem like small businesses, but they add up very quickly when you look at the, I won't say users, but the, the customers. Well, and there's, and there's some, uh, there's some question of, you know, does it include, for example, web analytics? So CCPA covers a wide, you know, wide variety of personal information. In fact, one of the things it has above and beyond GDPR and as you can see, some GDPR has some things beyond CCPA. And one thing CCPA is beyond GDPR is it defines what data is involved. It includes IP address. It also includes household data, which is a which is a different term. So if if something if somebody can relate something that happens from your home router, i.e. a piece of household data to you, then there you go, that, that's included in there too. So it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be personal data. So, for example, some of these IoT related devices will definitely fall under this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. Interesting to look at, at that part of it. Now, you mentioned that the CCPA um, started in January, January 1st, I believe, but when does the um, enforcement begin or the fines begin? That's well, really think, always the key. Yeah, I believe they're not, do, they're, they're not actually enforcing the fines until the 1st of uh, July. Um, but it also dates back. So if you needed to be compliant, you also needed to have been compliant for the last 12 months. So if somebody asks for their data, you've got to be able to provide their data that you'd have gathered over the last 12 months. So there's some backward step and forward looking step here. Um, but it's, 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 yeah, until we start seeing some of those uh, early cases, some of the, the, you know, then I think it will be interesting to see how, yeah, how, how it pans out. But we can, one thing I can guarantee um, yeah. Which is unfortunate, isn't it? There will be data breaches, and there will be some some people out of this before the end of the year. And there will be attorneys that are stepping up to the plate very quickly. <laughs> that you can uh, pretty much count on. There's a great opportunity if you're selling swimming pools to attorneys that are in data breach class action lawsuits. But anyway, <laughs> that can be scary. And the reason the reason I think for you know talking about CCPA today is is this an indication of you know the legislation to come. Where, where California starts, what do you see happening in other states and municipalities over the, the coming months? Similar? Do you think it'll roll out pretty quickly? We've, you've already seen some other states here in the U.S. starting to put, uh, put forward their own legislation for privacy. Um, let, I, I mentioned a funny story earlier on about the differences between legislation. Let me, let me give you that funny story, and then I'll explain sure. why, why I think this is important. Um, at the end of last year, I met with somebody from the European Union, um, in fact, works for the European Commission. Uh, and the person I happened to meet was, is a privacy expert. So I put it to them that, well, if I'm a Chilean national and I live in California and I fly to Heathrow and I'm doing something on, a, on an Australian website, yeah, and there's a data breach, uh, which legislation covered me? Yeah, who's who's takes prominence in that in that issue? And he just looked at me and went, "I have no idea." <laughs> yeah, and it, he's part of the European Commission's. Yeah, he understands the legislation as part of that team. So, right. and I think that was a really super interesting answer because while different states and different different countries are putting in their own legislation, I think at some stage it has to harmonise. So if we bring that back just to the US, if every state has different legislation and different rules, I think it's going to be way, way too complicated for companies to do business. Then when you enter into confusion, you could understand if an SMB turns around and says, this is just too confusing, I'm not going to do any of it, which obviously is completely wrong. Or they get too confused in knowing what to do. 
I actually think there needs to be harmonization across the entire entirety of the US. And then from the US, there needs to be some sort of global harmonization. So that some of this privacy legislation, the internet is not, it's not a Californian thing, is it? It's, no, it's, definitely not. It's a global, it's a global thing. Uh, and, the, and the regulation and um, legislation around it, I think needs to act and behave globally too. Well, it makes sense. The, the defensible defense that your team is using that you've coined, um, if you think of it in that perspective, especially for MSPs, because they can look at, I think, look at this law and look at, as you mentioned, of it can be 12 months previous looking at the data storage issues, is at least starting to discuss those things with their clients of, yeah, we may not, you may not fall under any of these specific legislation yet, but it's coming. And if you're shaping your security systems so they're defensible, um, we can help you know, lower that cost when it gets to that point too, is what can we do incrementally to improve your systems? Hey, because it's the right thing to do to protect their data, uh, keep them in business. But on the other hand, compliance is coming and here's ways that we can make sure that it's not a big bite out of you when it does finally hit your business, your state, whatever it may be, or if it's, you know, a nationwide, which I think has been discussed, but I don't know where we're at actually with that um, as of, as of today anyway. I think we might be quite some way from it, unfortunately. In, in, in yeah. Um, but and the other point I think I put in here is, you know, you mentioned, you know, what happens if I was a, a retailer supermarket down in, in LA and had 12 branches, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I think I'd even turn and say, if even if I was, you know, here, here where I live, a restaurant, and I had just one or two restaurants, and I've got maybe... 2,000 customers that frequent my restaurants, like, yeah, and I have a newsletter, I send out the menus or I send out offers, you know, and people subscribe. Now, is this, is this really covered under some of this legislation? Uh, no, I might be, you, I, I might think of myself as too small. The damage to the reputation of that business, if those 2,000 customers' data gets breached, I might start eating somewhere else as a co consumer. So the damage it can cause a business actually means that ignore the need to comply. It's just sensible to comply because it's actually protecting the longevity of your business. So actually MSPs and the channel should be selling this to every one of their customers. Makes perfect sense. I can just imagine in the future, you know, it's probably going to be more important. It doesn't matter how good their food is as long as their data is protected for their clients, right? Is that the new key? Yeah, maybe they should be the first item on some of the menus. On the menu, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our data is full. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, our tacos are okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, it, it's been a pleasure talking with you today, Tony. And unfortunately, our time's too quickly winding down. What I'd like to do, though, before we sign off, do you have any final points or recommendations you'd like to share with our audience? Well, actually, actually I think I just hit on that one. Is don't think it yeah. doesn't apply. Don't, don't put this off till tomorrow. Yeah, if you have, a, if you're a business, if you're a, an MSP, a channel partner, or if you're an end user, whatever, wherever you are in that chain, if you're not doing something to to think about privacy legislation, or you haven't done anything as a, as somebody that's storing data, you need to, and you need to act now. Fantastic. On behalf of IOTSA, I'd like to thank Tony Anscom from ESET for stopping by to share his security expertise today. Be sure to stop back for our next episode of Secure Connections and have a safe and highly profitable week. Thank you for joining us.